right, greetings everyone, and welcome to the second Starter Lecture of 2024. My name is Mark Swanson, and I'm privileged to serve as the Starter Chair in Private and Family Forestry. And excellent crowd here tonight, and I understand that there's 200 people registered for the online session, so welcome folks. If you're joining us from afar, we appreciate you just as well. And everyone here, thank you so much for being here at the Lovely Arboretum here in the PV Lodge. We're going to begin the session with the land acknowledgement, kindly presented to us by Laurel Sherman of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. Laurel, if you would, please. Good evening, everybody. I can jump down a little bit. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on this beautiful evening. This land acknowledgement was created by Dr. Christina Eisenberg, the Associate Dean for Inclusive Excellence in the College of Forestry. We are committed to taking people and the institutions with whom we work beyond the land acknowledgement to find ways to support and empower Indigenous peoples and their communities. We are mindful of the truth that for thousands of years, the Mary's River or Ampinifu Band of the Kalapuya have been in relationship with the land where Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon now sits, and we now live and work. We acknowledge that they were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon and that their living descendants are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. We value the long and deep interactions they have with the land and aspire to find ways to honor and manifest that value in our work and lives. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel, for sharing that land acknowledgement. It's important to recognize that indigenous stewardship has cascading effects on the land and resource. In the theme of today's start the lecture, for example, I'm reminded of the work of soil scientists like Firenzo Ullini, Darlene Zabowski, and others who demonstrated that indigenous fire stewardship of oak prairies and, uh, and savannas and woodlands had effects on soil properties. So indigenous stewardship indeed speaks to us today, even from beneath our very feet. The Starker Lectures, which have been ongoing since 1985, for almost our 40th year, that'll be next year, are given in memory of Thurman James, or T.J. Starker, and his son, Bruce Starker, and are supported by the Starker family at Starker Forest Incorporated. I'm grateful also for the internal support from the College of Forestry and the Starker Lecture Coordinating Committee, which at present consists of Anna Starker May, who I believe is joining us via Zoom, Laurel Sherman, who we just heard from, Dr. John Nair, Jessica Fitzmorris, and myself. I'm also grateful to the folks from Catering to IT who've helped make this evening a reality. I'm very grateful for everyone's collaboration on that. And I, I really also want to mention our marketing and communications uh, team, uh, Ronan Bryan, Julia Lott, Irene Shoppy, Kevin Lee, and Van Fancy. These folks put a lot of work in to making this evening a reality. And again, we're very grateful to all of you. So let's actually give them a hand to you. And I'd, all, I'd also like to recognize Mr. Bond Starker of the Starker family, who is joining us this evening. He's a regular attendee. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Mr. Randy Hereford, also of the Starker Forest uh, Organization. Please go to these folks in our organization are real leaders in terms of regional forestry here, and, and they play a wonderfully integrated role in terms of the delivery of forestry education and research, uh, especially through Oregon State University. So we're grateful for all that you do. Now this evening, we are fortunate to welcome a very special Starker lecturer, uh, not least because he is our very own Dean of the College of Forestry at Oregon State University, Dr. Thomas H. DeLuca. It's been my privilege to interact with Dr. DeLuca at no less than three different in institutions. And at each, uh, I've noted that he is regarded as a principled and compassionate leader who seeks to live with the people with whom he works and for the greater good of the natural resources community. And he is also a renowned scholar in the field of soil science. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison a master's degree from Montana State University, and a doctorate from Iowa State University, all in the field of soil science. He has held faculty and research positions at Bangor University in North Wales, at the Wilderness Society, at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, and at Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania. At Bangor University, he served as a joint chair in environmental science. 
From 2012 to 2017, Dr. DeLuca served as the director of the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences at the University of Washington. He then served as the dean of the W.A. Frankie School of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Montana. Since 2020, he has served as the dean here at the College of Forestry at Oregon State University. Dr. DeLuca's research has dealt largely with changes in soil carbon and nitrogen in response to many different driving factors, including disturbances such as fire. One thing that strikes me in particular is his investigation of the influences of various forms of carbon, including biochar, uh, that affect the storage and the transformation of nitrogen within the soil. And really, it's a solid reminder that, as John Muir famously commented, if we try to pick out anything by itself, we find that it is attached to everything else in the universe. It's beyond the scope of my comments to address Dr. DeLuca's scientific contributions in detail. That alone would take more time than we have. Dr. DeLuca is an avid outdoors person and can be found out in the forest pretty much every weekend. He's a runner, a skier, uh, including Nordic Alpine and backcountry styles, a cyclist, and a hunter. He has been married to his wife, Denise, for 38 years, and they have three boys that, in his words, push him to new limits. Vince, 33, residing in Norway. Emil, 31, residing in San Diego. And Henry, 25, residing in Missoula, Montana. And today we'll be hearing from this leader and scholar about soils. I believe we're going to come away this evening with a new, renewed appreciation for how fundamental the soil is in both the literal and a figurative sense. My doctoral advisor, Jerry Franklin, used to say that there were two major frontiers in forest science. One was the forest canopy, and one was beneath our feet, the forest soil. Both are, for different reasons, frequently overlooked. They both require effort to access and to observe, especially without occasioning observer effects. They're both highly variable in their attributes and behaviors. Certainly, one could find a lot of other frontiers in forest ecology and management, but these are two of the most expansive and two of the most important. The soil is the product of the geologic earth, a variable atmosphere, countless disturbances, and the persistent activity of organisms, including microbes, fungi, plants, and animals, and above all, the passage of time. The soil is a repository of energy and nutrients, an anchor for root systems, a habitat in and of itself, and a great storehouse of carbon, the central currency of all living things. It also is a key reservoir in that great cycle of water in our Earth system. The soil is also an historian. It records everything that happens to it, thus becoming of great importance to the paleontologist and to the geologist. Soils might fall from the sky as ash, as dust, as wind-blown sand, or the remnants of organisms. Or they may develop a place as chemistry and living things work on the slowly yielding rock. A great glacier might turn them into being, or rivers over time might deposit them one spring freshet at a time. A new soil might even appear 100 feet in the air as mosses and other epiphytes slowly lay down layers of biomass. And the trees themselves might even adventitiously sprout roots into their canopy soil. Soil may be the only thing remaining after humans have disturbed or impacted a site, or may be the first thing to fail or be degraded with human activity. Soils are our source, and for most terrestrial beings, our final earthly desperation. From dust to dust, or dust in the wind, is a theme of many religious and philosophical traditions, reflecting upon the impermanence yet interconnectedness of all living things. You don't need to go far to find a forester, a gardener, a farmer, or other person who will tell you that besides our own human ingenuity, the greatest resource that we have in this world is that of the soil. I can hardly envision a discipline within our college that would not do well to heed the findings of soil science. So with all this in mind, let us welcome Dr. DeLuca and open our minds to even deeper layers, or shall I say, horizons in the fascinating world of soils. Dr. DeLuca. Wow, thank you, Mark. That was a wonderful introduction. I think we're done. <laughs> There's about 11 seats right up front that are empty. So if somebody's standing outside and want to make a run for a seat or is in the back standing up, there are seats up front. So don't be shy, come, come, come on up and sit down. Okay, so 
Thank you for all being here tonight. I really, really appreciate seeing you all here. It's wonderful to have such a great turnout. I'm honored to be able to share a little bit with you tonight about soils. I am not going to talk about my research. I, as uh, Mark said, I, I worked a lot on fire and fire effects on soils and on feather mosses and as end fixing uh, entity and boreal uh, forest ecosystems. But today we're going to talk more broadly about soils. I think it's given up the ghost again, Jesse. Um, could somebody hit the next slide? Advance. No, not that one. Okay, great. So, what are we going to talk about today? Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, very contagious. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna cover soils from a, a broad perspective. And <laughs> today's I can give this talk without actually having slides. So if need be, we can go without the slides, but we're gonna talk about our inextricable link to soils, which uh, Mark alluded to, and sort of our, our historically link to soils as a as a people. And soils, then we'll move on and talk about soils as a living, breathing body of incredible diversity. And then move on and talk about soils, forest soils in particular, and how they diverge from our common wisdom of soils writ large and agricultural soils in particular. Talk a little bit about conservation and thinking about it from a soils based perspective. And then move on to talk about climate change and the stressors that it puts on our system and the resilience of soils and forest ecosystems in the face of those stressors and specifically fire. Next slide. Is it working now? Yeah, oh, I tried. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what would you do? Magic. Warmed it up. That's yeah. awesome. Okay, soil or dirt? <laughs> Randy Hereford said dirt 15 times when we're out in the field today, and that's not okay. <laughs> Soils are rarely treated with the respect they deserve. And um, uh, people often talk about soils as dirt, and dirt and soil are really two different things. You'll frequently, I'll frequently hear, the Dean's a dirt guy. You know, that's, or um, when I used to teach intro soils in Montana back in the 90s, people would say, do I really have to take a class in dirt? Ron, I'm sure you've heard that over and over. And, or I gotta go grab some dirt samples. And all those are wrong, because it's soils, not dirt. And dirt is a derogatory term. Soil is, is uh, or dirt is soil, out of place. it's where you don't want it. And we won't talk about where it might be, but just not where you want it. Um, yeah, soils are pretty important. And it's written all throughout our history that importance of soils. And of course, we're totally dependent on soils as a species. Our mineral makeup of our bodies comes almost exclusively from soils. Our nitrogen, all the proteins in our body, our, the phosphorus, the calcium, it's the vast, vast majority of it is coming from soils into plants, into us or directly from plants or by now. And of course, we have this relationship to soils that we're temporarily not soil, and we'll, and you'll hear that frequently. That right, yeah, we're the human beings. We're temporarily out of the dirt, but we'll be back in it eventually. <laughs> um, and there's of course religious references to our inextricable link to soils all uh, throughout the world, and I chose to just mention this one from uh, the. Uh, Bible and from the uh, the uh, Old Testament and uh, Genesis, where uh, it's written that God formed Adam out of soil and blew life into his nose, and then Eve was created by taking a rib from Adam's chest. Okay, well, we'll just say that both came from soil. Then we'll come back to that in a minute. And when they failed God in the Garden of Eden, God is recorded as saying. Uh, with, and um, they, that they were going to be subject to a life of toil and uh, said, from soil was thou taken, for soil thou art, and to soil thou shalt return. Well, 
those were powerful words and frightening words. If you think that being soiled is bad, I am kind of look forward to eventually being useful, more useful than I am today. And, and but now let's reimagine the Garden of Eden from a little different perspective. And this comes from uh, Daniel Hillel's book, Out of the Earth, where he uh, investigates the etymology of the names Adam and Eve. And Adam comes from the feminine gender name Adama, and uh, which is feminine gender for Earth, the physical Earth. And Eve uh, is a Pava, and I met an Eve here today. There she is, right back here. Your name comes from the ancient Hebrew name Pava, which means uh, all living things. So soils, as Mark referred to, is that interface between our physical and biological worlds is the wedding of Adam and Eve, the wedding of Earth and all living things. And it's a really different way of thinking about it. And if we take on that idea of uh, women being taken from a rib in Adam's chest, we could think about it from the perspective of, well, if Adam is all is uh, the physical earth, perhaps Adam's rib was monolinite clay. <laughs> clay minerals, there's a theory that says that clay minerals serve as this a bastion for chemical evolution on Earth, and specifically that clay minerals acted as a solid catalyst on which monomers, uh, reactions took place for monomer synthesis, and then aligning those monomers on that surface area of clay. Clays have an enormous surface area, and the, a single, like just filling the bottom of the handful of clay in the hand would have the surface area of a whole football field or larger if you laid out all the surface of the clay. It's so small and has internal surface and external surface and, and has a negative charge associated with it and uh, would organize these monomers in, uh, in ways and in concentrated forms and in a particular direction. And then the clay minerals would act as a catalyst for the condensation reactions between those monomers to form these polymers or biopolymers uh, that were the uh, early or remedial versions of RNA. And of course, RNA and nucleic acid at large is the substance of life, all living things. All of us are just some version of RNA, not that different than the trees right outside. The homology between us and a sedge or a tree or even closer, a, a cat or a pig is phenomenally close. We are in a body for ex extending the, uh, uh, the replication of RNA uh, of nucleic acid. Well, indigenous history or tradition uh, also is uh, right with uh, examples of references to soil and the, and the importance of soil in, uh, in their um, uh, societies and Salanan people's creation story is described in Halal's book as well. And it says, so uh, the quote is, so he creator took some clay and modeled the figure of a man and laid him on the ground. It goes on, I won't go into detail on it, but again, once again, humans were taken from soil. And uh, the Native American prophet Smahal when told, you need to start uh, an agrarian lifestyle and take up the plow, he said, and take a knife to my mother's breast, because that that untilled, untrammeled uh, soil was indeed the birthplace of all living things. And so, um, so what do we know about soil today? Uh, and if we if we look at uh, Leonardo da Vinci's quote, which many of you have heard before from the late 1400s, he said. We know more about the movement of celestial bodies than we do of the soil under our feet. Well, that is absolutely still true today. And, um, and we didn't have our first textbook written on soils till 1800s. And um, uh, there has been one Nobel Prize awarded in soils, and it's really microbiology, but he was a soil microbiologist. And that was Selman Waxman. Uh, like Rutgers since 52 for the discovery of streptomycin. And then 
Um, this one I just learned today, this beautiful quote from Bart and Starker, which was that soils are our most important resource. So the Starker family lives in, and believes that uh, uh, today, but we know very, very little about the soils in the earth. And we'll talk a bit more about that shortly. But let's just look at federal spending to give an idea of how much we care about the soil on Earth. We have a $6.5 trillion federal budget. And um, of that, for example, $546 billion go to defense. There's $91 billion that are spent on ag and natural resources, which is impressive. Most of those are commodity programs and, and whatnot. There's $124 million that goes to the NIFA program, which is a uh, agricultural research funding body and others, soils being funded within that. Uh, 6.7 billion goes to NASA and 1.3 billion to NSF and soils would make up some like 0.01% of the uh, NSF budget. So the point is we still don't spend a lot of effort. We spend a lot on the celestial bodies. Uh, we don't spend a lot on soils, and there's a lot to learn. So part of that is, is that soils are out of sight. We don't see them. We don't even sense them usually. Every so often you do when you're digging in the garden and you get that incredible smell that's that the aromatics of the actinomycetes that come up and it's just, it's, it, it's a overwhelming scent and feeling it. And uh, it feels like you should be digging it and perhaps eating it. And kids eat it all the time for good reason because it builds a strong microbiome. And our microbiome is surprisingly well connected to the soil microbiome when we're healthy. Um, but our focus tends to be on the canopy even when we have sticks like these uh, birch trees in, in Sweden. Uh, and, and part of that is we have no means of adequately sensing soils from above ground. When we sample, as Mark said earlier, we create artifacts. We pull a sample out of the ground. It's no longer connected to the fungal networks that it was part of before. It's no longer immersed in the bacterial saccharides that it was when you pulled the sample out of it. And so, and then we have analytic methods that are quite primitive for sensing or uh, analyzing soil characteristics. And uh, we have things like rhizotrons, which are low ground laboratories where you can peer into the soil through a glass window, but uh, they're static. And uh, the, there's very little way to interact with the soil. And I'd go on about it, but we, I don't want to keep you here too late. Okay, so we have a tendency to ignore the soil, but we know it's pretty darn important. And if we think about soil as a living body, we can describe it actually as a living body with the silt and sand functioning as the skeletal structure of the soil. Silt and sand. I need my beer. <laughs> <laughs> I need this too. Don't I? Oh. Silt and sand are nothing more, they're, they're particle sizes. And sand is two millimeters to 0 0.05 millimeters. That's all it is is a particle size but it's large relative to the other particle sizes. And then silt is 0 0.05 to 0 0.002 millimeters. Those two are so large in the sphere, in the, in the universe of soil that they are inert basically. And they, they function like skeletal material. Clay and organic matter, as I said, clay has this incredible surface area. Well, it's even greater for fine fraction organic matter. And those function like connective tissue. They literally have such high surface area and stickiness associated with that negative charge that they stick particles to, together into those secondary particles we call soil aggregates. And so it's like the connective tissue, the, the collagen that makes up your um, the, the cartilage and your joints or the skin that holds your body together. And then the water and dissolved solutes in the soil function like the lifeblood, taking carbon uh, or energy below ground to the microbes and shuttling nutrients to uh, plants. The microbial mass is the digestive and respiratory system of this living body. 
Now the question is, can soils reproduce? Because a true living body has to be able to re reproduce. And the fact is, soils don't make little soils per se. <laughs> they are constantly regenerating and constantly eroding. And so, in a way, they are constantly reproducing. I say down here a symbiosis. Well, soils are not going to live long without their uh, obligate partner. And their obligate partner are plants. So plants are dependent on soils, trees are dependent on soils, and soils are dependent on those plants. Soils can't live without the plant life. And uh, as the plants, as I said, take the energy from the sun, convert it to uh, CO2 into sugars, and those are uh, moved below ground and feed that, uh, that living body beneath the surface. And then in return, the plants uh, uh, receive nutrients from the soil environment that are free from the, uh, from the mineral matter because of the microbial activity in the soils and all of the uh, organic acids that they release, and the enzymes, and etc. So it's a, literally an obligate uh, symbiosis or mutualism. Soils are literally the cradle of life of, of our earth in many regards, and the, the diversity of, of organisms within the soil environment is phenomenal. In a, in a single teaspoon of soil, which would be the equivalent of the end of my thumb, there is a billion bacterial cells in a healthy uh, soil. For example, a garden soil or a healthy forest soil. In that same gram, there's a kilometer of fungal hygiene, threads of fungal mycelium. There are 10,000 protozoans. There's perhaps a thousand microarthropods, maybe a hundred nematodes. Okay, I'm stretching it a bit here and saying that there's a worm in that simple gram of soil, but it's a small worm. No, <laughs> yeah. usually measure worms and arthropods on a square meter. Okay, but a lot of life in a small amount of soil. Well, recent studies have demonstrated that soils are actually the largest repository of biodiversity on terrestrial Earth. 59% of all species on terrestrial Earth reside in the soil. About 85% of all fungi are soil-borne organisms. 51% of bacteria, 80% of plants have you know, seeds and root and grow from the soil. 98% uh, of non-segmented worms, etc. Incredible. And all of those organisms are interacting. And this just this is actually from a tropical food web uh, showing brown food webs and green food webs in tropical forest ecosystems. And I use this just mostly to just demonstrate the complexity of the food webs in soil and that they are not one-way webs. It's not just a trophic you know, cascade from uh, high to, to low. It is a, it is a uh, back and forth. We have uh, uh, nematodes consuming uh, 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 nematodes consuming bacteria or uh, protozoans and bacteria uh, fungi trapping nematodes and digesting nematodes in place. And of course, we have all these other organisms that are all engaging within each other and uh, and uh, processing uh, the what was the part of the green. Uh, uh, food web in the brown food web of the soil. And of course, everybody is familiar with mycorrhizal networks, or most of us are. And, and the recent book uh, by Susan Samara has really brought that to light for a lot of people. Um, uh, but those mycorrhizal networks are complex, and we only know very little about them, is the truth of the matter. Plants host these incredibly uh, um, uh, intricate. Uh, fungal symbionts that, that uh, for example, these uh, the ectomycorrhiza associated with, um, with uh, woody species or the endomycorrhiza associated with herbaceous species, they hugely expand the rooting capacity or the, the total surface area of engagement with the soil environment compared to the fine roots alone. And the, in these roots, 
these fine roots, as well as the um, fungal hypha, graft with one another and transfer uh, uh, resources back and forth between not just same species or similar species, but disparate species. And uh, bacteria colonize these mycorrhizal root tips. And this is just part of what I was talking about. And the complexity is so far beyond our, our knowledge yet that there's these bacterial communities that, co that colonize the mycorrhizal root uh, tips and, um, and access resources, release enzymes, release organic acids that free up uh, nutrients for the mycorrhizae to take up. And ectomycorrhiza also have been found to slow carbon degradation by inhibiting the saprobes in their surrounding environment. So they actually slow the decomposition of the, um, of the organic matter in the forest surrounding environment. Okay, so that's just a taste of the diversity and complexity of the forest soil environment. Let's talk about how forest soils diverge from their um, from common soil wisdom uh, that is mostly built around agriculture. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about how soils form. The process of soil formation is really a process of order, disorder, and reorder. And when I say that, I mean the rocks that were produced by volcanism or uplifted by tectonic activity and from sedimentary rock or metamorphic rock being pushed up to high elevations. And then it begins to decompose or disintegrate through the action of erosive action of water and organisms and um, wind and rain. And that material becomes disordered and chaotic and is redeposited somewhere. And and Mark referred to the redeposition of this material. And that deposition, whether it's water deposition as the custrian sediments in a lake or alluvial sediments in a river, those are in at that moment of deposition would be what we call parent material for the soil. And then it starts to be reorganized by the energy imparted by solar energy through the plant into the soil. So the carbon from the soil works against entropy and works against the chaos created by the decomposition to reorganize the soil into horizons and aggregates that have a very specific value to us and value to the ecosystems in how uh, soils function. In the Northwest, soils form at about a rate of three to five centimeters per 1,000 years. So if we think back to that tractor with the dust cloud rising above it in the background, uh, that's, that's accelerating motion. Whereas um, they, they do erode, but they erode at a similar rate, very slowly, and, and we tend to excel activities. Hans Jenny uh, came up with this beautiful, simple uh, equation for soil formation and said that soil formation is a function of the interaction of that parent material I mentioned with topography, climate, organisms, and time. And we use this nice, simple landscape model to show how soil development varies by landscape. And we're always, as soil scientists, trying to hold one variable constant as we look across the landscape and see what is the effect of topography on development on the shoulder slope that's eroding and soils are very thin and forming in bedrock compared to those forming in alluvium at the bottom of this valley in the toe slope where soils are deep and saturation slows decomposition of organic. And you start to get a sense of how it all works and why soils vary in the landscape uh, beyond just the geologic deposition. So we're funny though as people, we have a, we have a very simple perspective on soils that's we want a fertile soil, right? We want something that grows vegetables. We want something that grows our ornamentals in our yard. And when we think about fertile soil, we think about something like this, 
right? Like dark soil in those furrows, or you know that classic picture of the hands with the soil in it, and the plant growing out of it. It's, you know, it's like for some you know plant nutrient company or some of your fertilizer company, and it's really a misleading perspective. Number one, the soil is being held by human hands, and it needs to be in its intact environment to function fully and it's if anything the opposite of helped by humans generally it's the opposite but that's here or there uh it's always a nice picture that makes us feel good and um but this is what we think about when we think about fertile soil we think of what we call a mollusk which is a grassland soil it has a mollic epipedon that's the taxonomic descriptor for the A horizon in a grassland soil is a mollic epipedon like this right here, an organic matter enriched surface soil. And, um, and uh, it accumulates that organic matter over thousands of years. And it's what you know we, we want to think of as tops of our gardens. And these grassland soils are beautiful. I went to school in Iowa for a reason. It wasn't because of the beauty of the landscape <laughs> or the recreational opportunity. It's because of soils. And uh, it was an amazing place to go to school, actually. But it was like purgatory. I had to wait, you know, I had to get through it. I didn't waste time, needless to say. Um, but grassland soils dominate the central US and Eastern Oregon, but they don't dominate the world, okay? And yet that's what we think of moving soils, but forest soils are different. This is a spodosol. These are common in the boreal forest of Canada or, or Siberia or Sweden. And uh, you have the BS horizon. So you have the, this uh, E horizon at the surface as opposed to an organic enriched horizon. And then you've got organic matter down here at depth. And in this oxisol from the uh, tropics, we have we've actually lost the silica from the system. We start with in with that you know young parent material. We start with aluminosilicate minerals, and they're slowly desilicated over time. And in our oxisols, it's a residual accumulation of iron and aluminum oxides that are really difficult to manage because if you manage them wrong, they turn to brick. And they need organic matter. They need to be treated with respect. <laughs> and, and then uh, this is an insectosol, classic Montana forest soil. Randy, this is what we were talking about earlier today. Um, Starker property in the, in the inland Northwest, this is a classic forest soil. No A horizon, thin oak brick, uh, maybe a thin oak brick A, but uh, just very shallow and uh, limited development. These are the 12 soil orders of U.S. soil taxonomy. So these are soils from all over the world, and I'm not going to go into any detail on these except to say this is a mollusol here. Elphosol, inceptosol, entosol, oxisol, spodosols, andosols, and uh, what did I miss? Uh, entosols are all common forest soils, and they don't look like that garden soil that we were talking about. Shallow soils, permafrost soils have a lot of organic matter in because the cold temperatures would inhibit the decomposition of the organic matter, as do these wet histosols. So they accumulate an enormous amount of carbon. And we'll come back to that in a minute. One last thing, you know, I talked about the fungal hyphae and the and the you know the importance of it in, in, uh, in terms of increasing the rooting capacity. This image from a talk Cindy Prescott from UBC gave really does a nice job of demonstrating the difference between the uh, rooting capacity with the hyphae present and without. And this just shows the fungal bio to bacterial biomass ratio of forests and forest soils compared to grassland soils or ag or vineyard soils across the country of France. And it's just a really nice demonstration that Forest soils are fungal-dominated ecosystems in terms of the, the, um, the bio the, the soil, uh, the soil bio. But does anybody recognize that guy? That's Jeff Hatton. He's our department head for the firm, and uh, he's also 
of course, of a scientist. And here, Jeff is having a good time in a soil pit. <laughs> and, um, but why are forest soil scientists different than agronomic soil scientists? Well, we generally seek to understand the natural system and how it functions, whereas agronomic systems, we're thinking about how we can manipulate them. We manipulate them with tillage, with fertilizers, with different treatments that to optimize for a crop production that's renewed on an annual basis. In forest soils, we are planning for a system that is going to not be disturbed for a minimum of 35 years, and perhaps depending on our management strategy, uneven age, uh, continuous cover forestry, we're never gonna disturb that soil. And even with the, the uh, even age harvesting, you don't till the soil. You're dependent on the natural system for how it functions. So we manage without plowing or disturbance, few to uh, no external dependencies compared to other land uses. And they typically retain their natural morphology and management, which is unusual for all of our other land uses. We disturb the heck out of soils. When we plow them, when we convert them to urban uses, we cut, we dig out the topsoil and pile it, and then we sell it. <laughs> it's crazy. Or, or, Peat soils, we, we mine for peat to sell in bags in the garden soils. We don't have time to go into it. I'll get, I'll get really wound up. <laughs> uh, so let's talk a little bit about forest soils and conservation. As many of you have heard, the Biden administration and the UN Assembly, or General Assembly, um, uh, have committed to achieving 30% by 30, 30% conservation of land by 2030. The question is why? Well, because of carbon and biodiversity objectives, trying to store more carbon on the landscape and minimize biodiversity losses. But what's conservation? I mean, most of us don't stop and think about where do we draw the line for what's conservation and what's not? Where are we beating up ecosystems and where are we actually treating them pretty well? And, and Preservation is what most of us think about when we think about conservation. Lock it up, don't touch it. But that excludes humans and human resource needs. So we need to think about this in the context of humans' needs or demands. Because if we don't, if we're not careful, we push those demands elsewhere where people are less able to, laws are such that they, uh, end up exploiting the lands more than where we have laws in place to protect them. And is there an answer in forest soils? And I think there is, at least part of it. So I'm going to start with this example from boreal forest ecosystems. And it's just a, uh, it's just a nice system to look at because the boreal, like this, this is 100% cover for that soil. And this forest is a, uh, believe it or not, Trees grow very slowly in Sweden. It's cold up there. This is a old growth <laughs> forest <laughs> with big gaps, as one would expect, and uh, ericaceous shrubs in the understory, and then a moss bottom layer. So even beyond, below the shrub layer is the moss layer, which is this continual carpet of feather mosses. It's beautiful to sleep on. Like sleeping in Sweden is. You know, you put your mat out if it weren't for the insects, you know, the <laughs> flies and the mosquitoes. So if you have bedding, even that doesn't work. They go right <laughs> and they eat the heck out of you. And uh, so anyhow, um, so, but the point is it's continuous cover for the soil. And and of that uh, primary, net primary production, 35% is, you know, going into the fine roots and exudates. Just leaking carbon into the soil is about 10% of the total NPP in that system. And it's not an error. It's not a mistake. Plants wouldn't waste resources like that if it wasn't for a reason. They're feeding the system that feeds them back. And um, that's that I'll get some of those. Now, let's look at a system. And this isn't to dig at agriculture. We all need to eat. We need an agricultural system that is as sustainable as possible. And again, I'm not digging at agronomic soils here. 
Um, I, uh, the point is, is that when you have bare soil, you're starving the soil. There is that symbiosis is gone. You no longer are, you don't have exudates, you don't have litter the whole time it's bare. You have net carbon mineralization. In other words, the carbon in the soil, this is that dark color comes from organic matter and it's being decomposed and driven off as CO2. There's also leaching of dissolved organic carbon down deep into the soil under those conditions. And uh, there is, of course, raindrop impact and erosion. So if we look at the time that those soils are bare over a 100 year period, both spatially and temporally. So this has been clean tilled in the autumn in about uh, September, and it will remain bare until this is in Iowa. This will remain bare until uh, it's planted in April. And then it will be a long time before the corn or soybean uh, uh, growth is sufficient to protect them. The, and that's standard row crop production. So 30% to 90% of the time and space is bare soil. In managed forests, we're looking at one to 20% of the time that that soil is bare. And so if we, we repurpose the soil textural triangle here. How many of you remember the textural triangle? Couple? All right. <laughs> this, anyhow, this is the ternary figure is what it's called. It has three axes. And this is no plant cover or bare soil, zero to 100%. And then this is native species cover, zero to 100%. And this is exotic species cover, zero to 100%. And anywhere on this graph totals to 100%. So this site here is 70% bare soil and is uh, the other 30% is exotic species because corn isn't native to Iowa, even though we think of it is because <laughs> it's just, I'm a corn fed Iowa boy. No, I didn't grow up in Iowa. Really? Scott's pretty close. <laughs> Ate a lot of corn. I do like corn. Uh, so, um, anyhow, managed forests, on the other hand, these are native forests here on uh, trammel, uh, and then uh, uh, continual cover, uneven age management, uh, plant, uh, and then uh, plantation forest, long rotation, etc. So, you're in this zone of high conservation actually, and could be incentivized to move to a higher level of conservation value through, I mean, these programs are subsidized for growing commodity crops. Why not subsidize forestry for conservation values? If we look at this in terms of sustainability, then we need to meet our human resource needs. And we'll come back to this in a minute. We also need to provide a habitat for a diversity of species, the greatest diversity of species. Store carbon against our tide of carbon released to the atmosphere and have recreation. There's so many reasons to store carbon in the soil environment, way more than storing carbon for climate change reasons. It, it serves all these incredible purposes in the soil, which we won't go into right now. But the point is here, if we compare like row crop production, heat, it hits resource needs because it's feeding people or animals or, you know, it's a food a part of our food system. But in habitat quality is exceptionally low, carbon store is low, recreational value is low. And if we look at uh, something like uh, uh, short, uh, Long, uneven age managed forest here, moderate resource needs versus high in the plantation, but uh, lower on the uh, habitat uh, and uh, quality, both uh, decent for carbon storage, uh, but moderate uh, for recreational value on, and uh, uh, higher on the long. And so just kind of pieces together how these different things and this is uh, preservation, uh, native forest, low on the resource needs, but high on the other. Forest. So just in terms of looking at those 
values from a little different perspective. And if we look at the global biomass carbon in the canopy of our forests, it uh, accounts for about 350 to 650 petagrams of total carbon, whereas soils are about three times that amount. So from a carbon storage perspective, our, our place to store carbon is actually below ground, yet we're always focusing on how, how many trees we're going to plant to store more carbon. So let's talk a little bit about climate change and carbon storage and soils. Why do we care about forest soil carbon from a climate perspective? Well, we care because of this curve, because we are emitting enormous amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and we have now passed 420 parts per million, even though in this figure it was still just getting there. And that has this myriad impacts, okay, that I won't go into. So it's CO2 to the atmosphere. Where is it coming from? Jessica, oh, you're not there. Uh, this, this figure here, fossil fuel combustion. There's a, this bar continues because this is 4.9 billion metric tons of CO2 equivalent emitted in the US alone from fossil fuel combustion. Where is, so that's 93% of our emissions. Where is the rest coming from? Well, steel and concrete construction are right up there. And, and then, uh, you know, energy, transportation, uh, construction, agriculture, those account for these other uses outside of fossil fuel consumption and transportation and heating of buildings. Uh, is agriculture. Uh, and where is forestry? Well, forestry, according to EPA, is a net sink. And uh, wood construction does not contribute the way uh, steel and concrete construction, which are significant, where wood construction is a net sink. But can soils and forests and wood buildings really make a difference? Well, the additionality is small compared to our consumption of fossil fuels. And fossil fuels are buried in geologic deposits and would never interact with the atmosphere if we didn't drill it, refine it, and burn it. The, the others are cycling. Carbon is cycling through our forest ecosystems and through our prairies and our crop lines, and it cycles constantly. And we think we with the ag lands, we think about it on an annual cycle. So it's easy to see it's going in and it's going out. But for us, we think, oh, it's permanent. But it really isn't, not in comparison to the fossil fuel. It is a temporary source, temporarily not soil, just like us, just a little longer, 600 years instead of 100 years, 60 years. Ugh. 62. I just do it myself. Uh, okay, and, and if we, if we don't produce wood here in Oregon, bioregionally, and, and in a place where we can produce wood very quickly because of the climate, leakage will occur. The production will happen elsewhere. And if it happens in the global salt, then we're doing a disservice to the rest of the world in terms of biodiversity, in terms of carbon, in terms of uh, social justice. And then from a PNW forestry, we, we grow native species. We grow here on McDonald Dunn. What are we harvesting? Well, Douglas fir is a native species this year. Also oak, white oak, as well as hemlock and spruce and red cedar. Those are all native species. And the understory is made of natives, except for we introduce exotics to the disturbance. Whereas in our other systems, we almost exclusively plant with exotic species. And as I said, it's temporary. The storage is temporary. There's always fire, there's insects, there's wind throw, and there's just life. And climate change is increasing our disturbance rate. So it's something to keep in mind. Yes, let's store carbon in soil. Yes, let's store carbon in forests. But we can't depend on it to save us. It's not going to save us from ourselves, from a climate change. It has to be part of the larger vision 
to draw down the once we slow dramatically slow fossil fuel consumption to draw down with uh, with storage uses. And I, I should have mentioned that too. Most forest soil carbon is stored below ground, as I said, and the mineral soil carbon is surprisingly safe and isn't moved by uh, fire or uh, harvest the way uh, the old horizon is. This is just worth looking at. This is this is population growth, the pink line. This is from Matt Betts's paper a couple of years ago. And this is roundwood production, increasing demand for roundwood increasing linearly with the global population now over uh, 80 billion. So, it, you know, I, I remember uh, in the uh, 70s thinking, oh, the population's 3 billion was 3.6 or something. But in my lifetime, that's an enormous increase in population and demand for resources. The other funny thing about it is these are the forest soils here in Septicell, Spazel, and they're not big carbon stores, even though they store a lot of carbon, not compared to the big ones. The big ones are permafrost soils, the gelosols, like we mentioned earlier, and the histosols. And when you start looking at climate change melting out permafrost soils, there's an incredible storehouse or powder keg of carbon below ground in those systems. And uh, uh, that will add an enormous amount of uh, carbon in the atmosphere, and unfortunately, a lot of it will go as methane. I think more important is ensuring the resilience of our forest ecosystems in the face of, of climate change than worrying about if we're storing enough carbon, because it's not it's not even in the same uh, order of magnitude, or you know, that we're we're talking about. They're they're a total mismatch. Where the um, we have significant challenges with exotic pests moving into the Pacific Northwest with climate change, with the warming conditions, longer seasons, and the globalization. The, the Mediterranean oak bore was introduced on, on uh, oak barrels for wine. I want to drink wine, but I don't want to kill the Oregon white oaks. Oh, God, I've got a long ways to go. It was all Mark's fault. We talk so long. <laughs> All right. All three. All right. So, and the point was, and then also, I wanted to Max Bennett's paper here on the, um, you know, uh, extreme drought conditions and uh, die off uh, furs, and then to the, you know, increase in wildfire uh, size and scale of our fires. Well, all biomass has the potential to burn. All of our forests have the potential to burn. The question is, is how frequently? And of course, historically, indigenous peoples managed with fires because they had to live with it. And that's something that we have to get over as well and recognize that fire is a natural part of these forest ecosystems. And we can't completely, we can't suppress fires. We can't, this is Labor Day fires. There was no stopping that east-west wind. And those extreme events are what are gonna eat our lunch. And, and we have to learn how to live with fire and work with fire. And this just shows that in heavy use areas in the Bitterroot Valley, the uh, fire return of all historically pre-European presence was about nine years. In contemporary time, it's more like 30 years because we've eliminated uh, you know, the indigenous burning and we also suppress wildfire whenever possible. Well, we started suppressing fire effectively after the 1910 fires which if you haven't read The Big Burn, you should. And then another good book to read is uh, Worst Heart of Time, which is about the Dust Bowl. Both those are by Timothy Egan. And, and this, uh, um, uh, but the US Forest Service and, and state agencies are amazing at putting out fire. They are amazing. They put out 97% of all fire starts, but it's those 3% that get away on those bad conditions that account for the five to nine million acres fire in the US. Couple that with the heavy harvesting that occurred on federal forest land, overly heavy harvesting on federal land in the 50s to 70s, and then a dramatic reduction in the harvest of um, uh, peers in Oregon uh, on federal lands, as, and especially after the 90s with the Northwest Forest Group. 
And of course, with that, we have fuel accumulation and more severe fires. And in the interest of time, I won't explain it, just says that the uh, managed forests that then were unmanaged become more dense. And, um, and these mature forests that we want to protect that are huge storehouses of carbon and biodiversity can be resilient because of you know the thick bark and the uh, uh, deeper rooting systems and and uh, but the latter fuels make them uh, at, put them at risk as does climate change for the longer fire season. This, uh, I, Andrew Michelle, one of our scientists in the tree ring lab, uh, provided this to me, this picture of a wood cookie taken from the McDonald dump. And look at the fire frequency. This is in Soap Creek area. Look at the fire frequency. Up until 1846, there was fire about every 15 years. This is, you know, this is Western Oregon, this is in Montana. And that's, that's a function of indigenous burn, maintaining open prairies and savannas and open conifer forests. Really different than what we've been thinking. But if I just go back and I take this cool tool called Landscape Explorer that this guy in Montana developed and, and uh, zoom in on Lewisburg Sound, I get a sense from 1940 or 1940s to 1950, uh, of what it looked like up there at the saddle trail. And then I look at it today and there's a lot of firs on the landscape and the oak is greatly uh, gone, or at least it's under canopy. And if we look at McCulloch Peak today, our uh, 1940s, and of course, you see there's, there's trails in here that make you think or roads that, that there's was almost certainly harvesting that took place here. But this, there's, it's not stump fields. This was just a much more open canopy. Now imagine 1840, what it would have looked like, or imagine 1490. And this, it's not to say we need to go back to that and create this totally open canopy, but there's way more biomass on the landscape than there used to be. And it uses a phenomenal amount of water. And in drought years, it stresses the neighboring trees and it kills, and that's what Max Bennett's paper was showing. And, and it also, this is a far less flammable landscape than, the, than, the, than this. And, and so we need to get our head around that and figure out how to work with fire and how to work with manage to make our uh, forests less flammable on those years where we have a real problem with the labor day fire. Well, soil is also a history book, if you know how to read it. Mark alluded to this in his opening comments. And the, the, I'll just cut to the chase and say, there's brown and red soils on McDonald Dunn. Look for them when you're driving around. These are just road cuts. And you see the brown soils on like towards Chip Ross, and you see the red soils uh, like, out on the dung, for example, or um, uh, or in places on. Oh, now I want. Thank you, Kim. I'm just going to move ahead. <laughs> so it's a sign. Move ahead. Move on. Um, so uh, okay. So uh, I was just saying that uh, soils are a history book. And, and the, the brown soils are organic matter enriched, and they tell you there probably was oak savanna there, or some type of long-term open canopy forest there. And the red soils tell you it's been in fir forest for a long time. Those things don't change overnight. They don't change over 100 years. It takes a long time to erase that, that history book. Okay, so um, just finishing up, Jessica, um, I... Uh, uh, Fires also produce pyrogenic carbon and or charcoal, and charcoal has an incredible longevity in the soil. It, instead of lasting tens to maybe you know tens of years, like a log buried in soil might last sixty years or something if it's getting punky and slowly decomposing. 
Charcoal can have a uh, mean resonance time in soil measured in hundreds of years to thousands of years. So it doesn't decompose as readily, especially depending on temperature. Charcoal generated at high temperatures is even more resistant than that generated at low temperatures. Okay, and it, and it basically just dumps carbon directly into the passive carbon pool in soils. And so it's a, it's a long-term store house of carbon, and it does all these phenomenal things. Uh, stimulates mycorrhizal infection, stimulates nutrient turnover, uh, water holds water. Well, when we have low severity fires and mixed severity fires like this one, we you can see we're leaving a bunch of pyrogenic carbon on the floor, and we left behind a good chunk of the O-horizon about 50% of the horizon in this case. And when we um, have high severity fires, like this one uh, in Northern California, we have lost most of the horizon. We've lost the, uh, we don't have the deposition of that uh, pyrogenic carbon. And we don't, we can lose the seed bait. So we don't have the sprouting and regeneration like we might have other ones. So, Creating resilience. I don't have time to talk about this. This is for other people that are experts in, in the field, but we need to in, in, in imbue, our, imbue our systems with greater resilience to climate change because right now we're in we're in not in a good condition, not an east side forest and not a west side forest. And we have good evidence that shows that revert, reducing sand density through mechanical thinning and reintroduction of fire management of these forests will reduce the um of the these overstock forests will reduce their flammability and on the west side we need to first reconstruct that fire history and get a sense of what was that fire history like and and in, in uneven age management might be more resilient but it's going to be far less productive and we it's unrealistic for a lot of landowners and uh but uh could be right for given circumstances. And then with even age forestry, we're looking at higher risk with increasing fire and drought and stress. But there's a role for hardwoods and species diversity and offsetting that. And there are different practices that can be employed. And that's for somebody like Mark Swanson to address. <laughs> so I'll just finish with saying these things are the things we talked about and I don't need to say it again. I'll just say that forest soils um, are exceptionally important, soil is important, and we're just temporarily not yet. And um, resilience and recovery really depend on uh, protecting our soil resources as well. And with that, I will finish up and say there are other soil scientists that are doing incredible work and I don't have time to talk about them today, but I love them. <laughs> and um, and uh, we're really lucky to have them. Uh, and I won't go through it in the interest of time, and I'll just say thank you and take the questions. I really appreciated that one. That wonderful tour through the world of soils and its relevance for our conservation questions and challenges today. I have two apologies. One is for my long windedness in the introduction. And I also committed a grave omission in my mentioning of the folks on the committee. I neglected to mention Julie Woodward. So, Julie, please accept my apologies and my thanks for your work on the committee. So, any questions? You can take like one or two questions. One or two questions. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, and please stick around. We have an open house following this, so please stick around for conversation or fellowship. But in the meantime, yes, we do have the opportunity for a question. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I do have a question. Jeff, John, I have a question. Um, okay. In one of the charts you mentioned that managed forests have the highest conservation value. No, uh, not the highest. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, it was the, the highest was the uh, was the uh, you know wilderness or native okay. forest. 
Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. It's like wouldn't the wilderness forest be? Yeah, yeah, it has. Okay. Forest. Yeah. Thank you, John. Sorry. Sorry for that confusion. I have a question about um, storing carbon underground. I'm not really familiar with the process. How do they do that? And uh, how deep do they go? How do they inject it, or what, what do they do? Uh, with just carbon uh, yeah, accumulation in soils. Well, it's both talk about storing it history on the ground. Oh, not by mechanical deposition, but but just by uh, soils. Uh, people are trying to devise systems to uh, enhance soil carbon storage in soils and minimize loss. So in agricultural systems, you'll hear of regenerative agricultural systems with re relay cropping and cover cropping and keeping that cover on the soil and keeping something growing there all the time with regenerative ag creates that cover and that constant flow of carbon into the system that, that's, that not only slows the decomposition of carbon, resident carbon, but increases the amount of carbon stored in the soil. So the, that's the type of example of people wanting to store carbon in soils. It's not that they're you know, digging it up and burying something, and it's a, just a process of changing your management to uh, optimize carbon storage. We could do one more question. Giannis was short. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Uh, you talked about uh, we don't we know more about basically everything else that we do about soil. Uh, what are the most pressing questions when it comes to soil? Yeah. If you if there's a short answer. To that. <laughs> That's a really hard question. <laughs> um, wow, and a really good question. From from my perspective, I guess I would say that uh, finding that uh, link between microbial diversity and uh, function would be the most important thing. We know, we have a sense of what is in the soil. We have a, we can use molecular tools to say, here's the diversity of organisms in the soil, but we can't actually do anything with that. We can't say, the only organisms that grow in auger plates counts for like 5% of the diversity that exists in soil. So back in the day, we used to be able to do manipulative studies and understand what an organism does. Now we have this molecular analysis that shows this incredible diversity, but we can't really see the function of those. We do have certain tools to get at that, like uh, instead of so you look at the RNA as this is what's being expressed in the soil, but still it doesn't it doesn't tell you what that specific set of organisms are doing or what their relative contribution to that is. So an example would be nitrogen fixation. We can see there's an incredible diversity of free living nitrogen fix, fixing bacteria in the soil. How active are they? We can even quantify how many there are per unit mass of soil, but we don't know how much nitrogen they fix. We just know that they're there. And then we can measure nitrogen fixation using like acetylene reduction or some tool to measure an end fixation. But we don't know which of them is doing and how to optimize their, their activity. So, so that would be one of those things. Yeah. With that, let's thank Dr. Luca one more time.